This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hickory Dickory Dock from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Hickory Dickory Dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Hickory Dickory Dock. Within the hollow wall of an old brick mansion, away up near the roof, there lived a family of mice. It was a snug little house, pleasant and quiet, and as dark as any mouse could desire. Mama Mouse liked it, because, as she said, the draft that came through the rafters made it cool in summer, and they were near enough to the chimney to keep warm in winter time. Besides the Mama Mouse, there were three children, named Hickory and Dickory and Doc. There had once been a Papa Mouse as well, but while he was hunting for food one night, he saw a nice piece of cheese in a wire box and attempted to get it. The minute he stuck his head into the box, however, it closed with a snap that nearly cut his head off. And when Mama Mouse came down to look for him, he was quite dead. Mama Mouse had to bear her bitter sorrow all alone, for the children were too young at that time to appreciate their loss. She felt that people were cruel to kill a poor mouse for wishing to get food for himself and his family. There is nothing else for a mouse to do but take what he can find, for mice cannot earn money as people do, and they must live in some way. But Mama Mouse was a brave mouse, and knew that it was now her duty to find food for her little ones. So she dried her eyes and went bravely to work gnawing through the baseboard that separated the pantry from the wall. It took her some time to do this, for she could only work at night. Mice like to sleep during the day and work at night when there are no people around to interrupt them, and even the cat is fast asleep. Some mice run about in the daytime, but they are not very wise mice who do this. At last Mama Mouse gnawed a hole through the baseboard large enough for her to get through into the pantry. And then her disappointment was great to find the bread jar covered over with a tin pan. How thoughtless people are to put things where a hungry mouse cannot get at them, said Mama Mouse to herself with a sigh. But just then she espied a barrel of flour standing upon the floor, and that gave her new courage, for she knew she could easily gnaw through that, and the flour would do to eat just as well as the bread. It was now nearly daylight, so she decided to leave the attack upon the flour barrel until the next night, and gathering up the children a few crumbs that were scattered about, she ran back into the wall and scrambled up to her nest. Hickory and Dickory and Doc were very glad to get the crumbs, for they were hungry, and when they had breakfasted, they all curled up alongside their mother and slept soundly throughout the day. Be good children, said Mamma Mouse the next evening, as she prepared for her journey to the pantry, and don't stir out of your nest till I come back. I am in hopes that after tonight we shall not be hungry for a long time, as I shall gnaw a hole in the back of the flour barrel where it will not be discovered. She kissed each one of them goodbye and ran down the wall on her errand. When they were left alone, Hickory wanted to go to sleep again, but little Doc was wide awake and tumbled around so in the nest that his brothers were unable to sleep. I wish I could go with mother some night, said Doc. It's no fun to stay here all the time. She will take us when we are big enough, replied Dickory. We are big enough now, declared Doc, and if I knew my way, I would go out into the world and see what it looks like. I know a way out, said Hickory, but Mama wouldn't like it if we should go without her permission. She needn't know anything about it, declared the naughty Doc, for she will be busy at the flour barrel all the night. 
Take us out for a little walk, Hick, if you know the way. Yes, do, urged Dickory. Well, said Hickory, I'd like a little stroll myself. So if you'll promise to be very careful and not get into any mischief, I'll take you through the hole that I have discovered. So the three little mice started off, with Hickory showing the way, and soon came to a crack in the wall. Hickory stuck his head through, and finding everything quiet, for the family of people that lived in the house were fast asleep, he squeezed through the crack, followed by his two brothers. Their little hearts beat very fast, for they knew if they were discovered they would have to run for their lives. But the house was so still they gained courage and crept along over a thick carpet until they came to a stairway. "'What shall we do now?' whispered Hickory to his brothers. "'Let's go down,' replied Doc. So, very carefully, they descended the stairs and reached the hallway of the house. And here they were very much surprised by all they saw. There was a big rack for hats and coats, and an umbrella stand, and two quaintly carved chairs, and most wonderful of all, a tall clock that stood upon the floor and ticked out the minutes in a grave and solemn voice. When the little mice first heard the ticking of the clock, they were inclined to be frightened, and huddled close together upon the bottom stair. "'What is it?' asked Dickory in an awed whisper. "'I don't know,' replied Hickory, who was himself rather afraid. "'Is it alive?' asked Doc. "'I don't know,' again answered Hickory. Then, seeing that the clock paid no attention to them, but kept ticking steadily away, and seemed to mind its own business, they plucked up courage and began running about. Presently, Dickory uttered a delightful squeal that brought his brothers to his side. There, in a corner, lay nearly half of a bun which little May had dropped when the nurse carried her upstairs to bed. It was a great discovery for the three mice, and they ate heartily until the last crumb had disappeared. "'This is better than a cupboard or a pantry,' said Doc, when they had finished their supper. "'And I shouldn't be surprised if there were plenty more good things around if we only hunt for them.' But they could find nothing more, for all the doors leading into the hall were closed, and at last Doc came to the clock and looked at it curiously. "'It doesn't seem to be alive,' he thought although it does make so much noise. I'm going behind it to see what I can find. He found nothing except a hole that led to inside of the clock, and into this he stuck his head. He could hear the ticking plainer than ever now, but looking way up to the top of the clock, he saw something shining brightly, and thought it must be good to eat, if he could only get at it. Without saying anything to his brothers, Doc ran up the sides of the clock until he came to the works, and he was just about to nibble at a glistening wheel to see what it tasted like, when suddenly, bang, went the clock. It was one o'clock, and the clock had only struck the hour, but the great gong was just beside Doc's ear, and the noise nearly deafened the poor little mouse. He gave a scream of terror and ran down the clock as fast as he could go. When he reached the hall, he heard his brothers scampering up the stairs, and after them he ran with all his might. It was only when they were safe in their nest again that they stopped to breathe, and their little hearts beat fast for an hour afterward, so great had been their terror. When Mamma Mouse came back in the morning, bringing a quantity of nice flour with her for breakfast, they told her of their adventure. She thought they had been punished enough already for their disobedience, so she did not scold them, but only said, You see, my dears, your mother knew best when she told you not to stir from the nest. 
children sometimes think they know more than their parents, but this adventure should teach you always to obey your mother. The next time you run away, you may fare worse than you did last night. Remember your poor father's fate. But Hickory and Dickory and Doc did not run away again. End of Hickory Dickory Doc This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Wedge, Richmond, Virginia. Little Bo Peep from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. On the beautiful, undulating hills of Sussex feed many flocks of sheep which are tended by many shepherds and shepherdesses, and one of these flocks used to be cared for by a poor woman who supported herself and her little girl by this means. They lived in a small cottage nestled at the foot of one of the hills, and each morning the mother took her crook and started out with her sheep, that they might feed upon the tender, juicy grasses with which the hills abounded. The little girl usually accompanied her mother, and sat by her side upon the grassy mounds, and watched her care for the ewes and lambs, so that in time she herself grew to be a very proficient shepherdess. So when the mother became too old and feeble to leave her cottage, little Bo Peep, as she was called, decided that she was fully able to manage the flocks herself. She was a little mite of a child with flowing nut-brown locks, and big gray eyes that charmed all who gazed into their innocent depths. She wore a light gray frock, fastened about the waist with a pretty pink sash, and there were white ruffles around her neck and pink ribbons in her hair. All the shepherds and shepherdesses upon the hills, both young and old, soon came to know little Bo-Peep very well indeed and there were many willing hands to aid her if, which was not often, she needed their assistance. Bo Peep usually took her sheep to the side of a high hill above the cottage, and allowed them to eat the rich grass while she herself sat upon a mound and, laying aside her crook and her broad straw hat with its pink ribbons, devoted her time to sewing and mending stockings for her aged mother. One day, while thus occupied, she heard a voice behind her say, "'Good morning, little Bo Peep!' And looking up, the girl saw a woman standing near her, and leaning upon a short stick. She was bent nearly double by weight of many years. Her hair was white as snow, and her eyes as black as coals. Deep wrinkles seamed her face and hands, while her nose and chin were so pointed that they nearly met. She was not pleasant to look upon but Bo Peep had learned to be polite to the aged, so she answered sweetly, "'Good morning, mother. Can I do anything for you?' "'No, dearie,' returned the woman in a cracked voice, "'but I will sit by your side and rest for a time.' The girl made room on the mound beside her, and the stranger sat down and watched in silence the busy finger sew up the seams of the new frock she was making. By and by the woman asked, why do you come out here to sew? Because I am a shepherdess, replied the girl. But where is your crook? On the grass beside me. And where are your sheep? Bo Peep looked up and could not see them. They must have strayed over the top of the hill, she said, and I will go and seek them. Do not be in a hurry, croaked the old woman. They will return presently without your troubling to find them. "'Do you think so?' asked Bo Peep. "'Of course. Do not the sheep know you?' "'Oh, yes, they know me every one.' "'And do not you know the sheep?' "'I can call every one by name,' said Bo Peep confidently. "'For though I am so young a shepherdess, I am fond of my sheep, and know all about them.' The old woman chuckled softly, as if the answer amused her, and replied, "'No one knows all about anything, my dear.' "'But I know all about my sheep,' protested little Bo-Peep. "'Do you indeed? Then you are wiser than most people. "'And if you know all about them, and you also know they will come home of their own accord, 
and I have no doubt they will all be wagging their tails behind them as usual. Oh, said little Bo Peep in surprise. Do they wag their tails? I never noticed that. Indeed, exclaimed the old woman. Then you are not very observing for one who knows all about sheep. Perhaps you have never noticed their tails at all. No, answered Bo Peep thoughtfully. I don't know that I ever have. The woman laughed so hard at this reply that she began to cough, and this made the girl remember that her flock had strayed away. I really must go and find my sheep, she said, rising to her feet, and then I shall be sure to notice their tails and see if they wag them. Sit still, my child, said the old woman. I am going over the hilltop myself, and I will send the sheep back to you. So she got upon her feet and began climbing the hill, and the girl heard her saying as she walked away, Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them, but leave them alone and they'll come home, all wagging their tails behind them. Little Bo Peep sat still and watched the old woman toil slowly up the hillside and disappear over the top. By and by she thought, very soon I shall see the sheep coming back, but time passed away and still the errant flock failed to make its appearance. Soon the head of the little shepherdess began to nod, and presently, still thinking of her sheep, little Bo Peep fell fast asleep and dreamt she heard them bleeding, but when she awoke she found it a joke, for still they were a-fleeting. The girl now became quite anxious and wondered why the old woman had not driven her flock over the hill. But as it was now time for luncheon, she opened her little basket and ate of the bread and cheese and cookies she had brought with her. After she had finished her meal and taken a drink of cool water from a spring nearby, she decided she would not wait any longer. So up she took her little crook, determined for to find them, and began climbing the hill. When she got to the top there was never a sight of sheep about, only a green valley and another hill beyond. Now really alarmed for the safety of her charge, Bo Peep hurried into the valley and up the farther hillside. Panting and tired, she reached the summit and, pausing breathlessly, gazed below her. Quietly feeding upon the rich grass was her traunt flock, looking as peaceful and innocent as if it had never strayed away from its gentle shepherdess. Bo Peep uttered a cry of joy and hurried toward them, but when she came near she stopped in amazement and held up her little hands with a pretty expression of dismay. She had found them indeed, but it made her heart bleed, for they had left their tails behind them. Nothing was left to each sheep but a wee little stump where a tail should be, and little Bo Peep was so heartbroken that she sat down beside them and sobbed bitterly. But after a while the tiny maid realized that all her tears would not bring back the tails to her lampkins. So she plucked up courage and dried her eyes, and arose from the ground just as the old woman hobbled up to her. "'So you have found your sheep, dearie,' she said in her cracked voice. "'Yes,' replied little Bo Peep, with difficulty repressing a sob. "'But look, mother, they have all left their tails behind them.' "'Why, so they have!' exclaimed the old woman. And then she began to laugh as if something pleased her. "'What do you suppose has become of their tails?' asked the girl. "'Oh, someone has probably cut them off. They make nice tippets in winter time, you know.' And then she patted the child upon her head and walked away down the valley. Bo Peep was much grieved over the loss that had befallen her dear sheep, and so, driving them before her, she wandered around to see if by any chance she could find the lost tails. But soon the sun began to sink over the hilltops, and she knew she must take her sheep home before night overtook them. She did not tell her mother of her misfortune, for she feared the old shepherdess would scold her, and Bo Peep had fully decided to seek for the tales and find them before she related the story of their loss to anyone. Each day, for many days after that, little Bo Peep wandered about the hills seeking the tails of her sheep, and those who met her wondered what had happened to make the sweet little maid so anxious. But there is an end to all troubles, no matter how severe they may seem to be, and it happened one day as Bo Peep did stray onto a meadow hard by. 
There she espied their tails side by side, all hung on a tree to dry. The little shepherdess was overjoyed at this discovery, and reaching up her crook, she knocked the row of pretty white tails off the tree and gathered them up in her frock. But how to fasten them on to her sheep again was the question, and after pondering the matter for a time she became discouraged, and, thinking she was no better off than before the tails were found, she began to weep and to bewail her misfortune. But amidst her tears she bethought herself of her needle and thread. Why, she exclaimed, smiling again, I can sew them on, of course. Then she heaved a sigh and wiped her eye, and ran o'er hill and dale o and tried what she could, as a shepherdess should, to tack to each sheep its tail o But the very first sheep she came to refused to allow her to sew on the tail, and ran away from her, and the others did the same, so that finally she was utterly discouraged. She was beginning to cry again, when the same old woman she had before met came hobbling to her side and asked, "'What are you doing with my cat-tails?' "'Your cat-tails,' replied Bo Peep in surprise. "'What do you mean?' "'Why, these tails are all cut from white pussy-cats, and I put them on the tree to dry. What are you doing with them?' "'I thought they belonged to my sheep,' answered Bo Peep sorrowfully. But if they are really your pussy-cat tails, I must hunt until I find those that belong to my sheep." "'My dear,' said the old woman, "'I have been deceiving you. You said you knew all about your sheep, and I wanted to teach you a lesson. For however wise we may be, no one in this world knows all about anything. Sheep do not have long tails. There is only a little stump to answer for a tail. Neither do rabbits have tails, nor bears, nor many other animals. And if you have been observing, you would have known all this when I said the sheep would be wagging their tails behind them, and then you would not have passed all those days in searching for what is not to be found. So now, little one, run away home, and try to be more thoughtful in the future. Your sheep will never miss the tails, for they never had them. And now, little Bo Peep no more did weep, my tale of tales ends here. Each cat has one, but sheep have none, which, after all, is queer. End of Little Bo Peep This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe, the story of Tommy Tucker, from Mother Goose in Prose, by L. Frank Baum. Little Tommy Tucker sang for his supper. What did he sing for? White bread and butter. How could he cut it without any knife? How could he marry without any wife? Little Tommy Tucker was a waif of the streets. He never remembered having a father or mother or anyone to care for him, and so he learned to care for himself. He ate whatever he could get, and slept wherever night overtook him, in an old barrel, a cellar, or when fortune favored him, he paid a penny for a cot in some rude lodging house. His life about the streets taught him early how to earn a living by doing odd jobs, and he learned to be sharp in his speech and wise beyond his years. One morning, Tommy crawled out from a box in which he had slept overnight, and found that he was hungry. His last meal had consisted of a crust of bread, and he was a growing boy with an appetite. He had been unable to earn any money for several days, and this morning life looked very gloomy to him. He started out to seek for work or to beg a breakfast, but luck was against him, and he was unsuccessful. By noon he had grown more hungry than before, and stood before a bake shop for a long time, looking wistfully at the good things behind the window panes, and wishing with all his heart he had a halfpenny to buy a bun. And yet it was no new thing for little Tommy Tucker to be hungry, and he never thought of despairing. He sat down upon a curbstone and thought what was best to be done. Then he remembered he had frequently begged a meal at one of the cottages that stood upon the outskirts of the city, and so he turned his steps in that direction. I have had neither breakfast nor dinner, he said to himself, and I must surely find a supper somewhere, or I shall not sleep much to-night. It is no fun to be hungry. 
so he walked on until he came to a dwelling-house where a goodly company sat upon a lawn and beneath a veranda it was a pretty place and was the home of a fat alderman who had been married that very day the alderman was in a merry mood and seeing tommy standing without the gate he cried to him come here my lad and sing us a song tommy at once entered the grounds and came to where the fat alderman was sitting beside his blushing bride can you sing inquired the alderman no answered tommy earnestly but i can eat ho ho laughed the alderman that is a very ordinary accomplishment any one can eat if it please you sir you are wrong replied tommy for i have been unable to eat all day and why is that asked the alderman because i have had nothing to put in my mouth but now that i have met so kind a gentleman i am sure that i shall have a good supper the alderman laughed again at this shrewd answer and said you shall have supper no doubt but you must sing a song for the company first and so earn your food tommy shook his head sadly i do not know any song sir he said the alderman called a servant and whispered something in his ear the servant hastened away and soon returned bearing upon a tray a huge slice of white bread and butter white bread was a rare treat in those days as nearly all the people ate black bread baked from rye or barley flour now said the alderman placing the tray beside him you shall have this slice of white bread and butter when you have sung us a song and complied with one condition and what is that condition asked tommy i will tell you when we have heard the song replied the fat alderman who had decided to have some amusement at the boy's expense tommy hesitated but when he glanced at the white bread and butter his mouth watered in spite of himself and he resolved to compose a song since he did not know how to sing any other so he took off his cap and standing before the company he sang as follows a bumblebee lit on a hollyhock flower that was wet with the rain of a morning shower while the honey he sipped his left foot slipped and he couldn't fly again for half an hour good cried the alderman after the company had kindly applauded tommy i can't say much for the air nor yet for the words but it was not so bad as it might have been give us another verse so tommy pondered for a moment and then sang again a spider threw its web so high it caught on a moon in a cloudy sky the moon whirled round and down to the ground fell the web and captured a big blue fly why that is fine roared the fat alderman you improve as you go on so give us another verse i don't know any more said tommy and i am very hungry one more verse persisted the man and then you shall have the bread and butter upon the condition so tommy sang the following verse a big frog lived in a slimy bog and caught a cold in an awful fog the cold got worse the frog got hoarse till croaking he scared a pollywog you are quite a poet declared the alderman and now you shall have the white bread upon one condition what is it said tommy anxiously that you cut the slice into four parts but i have no nice remonstrated the boy but that is the condition insisted the alderman if you want the bread you must cut it surely you do not expect me to cut the bread without any knife said tommy why not asked the alderman winking his eye at the company because it cannot be done how let me ask you sir could you have married without any wife ha 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 laughed the jolly alderman and he was so pleased with tommy's apt reply that he gave him the bread at once and a knife to cut it with thank you sir said tommy now that i have the knife it is easy enough to cut the bread and i shall now be as happy as you are with your beautiful wife the alderman's wife blushed at this and whispered to her husband the alderman nodded in reply and watched tommy carefully as he ate his supper when the boy had finished his bread which he did very quickly you may be sure the man said how would you like to live with me and be my servant little tommy tucker had often longed for just such a place where he could have three meals each day to eat and a good bed to sleep in at night so he answered i should like it very much sir so the alderman took tommy for his servant and dressed him in a smart livery and soon the boy showed by his bright ways and obedience that he was worthy any kindness bestowed upon him he often carried the alderman's wig when his master attended the town meetings and the mayor of the city who was a good man was much taken with his intelligent face so one day he said to the alderman i have long wanted to adopt a son for i have no children of my own but i have not yet been able to find a boy to suit me that lad of yours looks bright and intelligent 
and he seems a well-behaved boy into the bargain he is all that you say returned the alderman and would be a credit to you should you adopt him but before i adopt a son continued the mayor i intend to satisfy myself that he is both wise and shrewd enough to make good use of my money when i am gone no fool will serve my purpose therefore i shall test the boy's wit before i decide that is fair enough answered the alderman but in what way will you test his wit bring him to my house to-morrow and you shall see said the mayor so the next day the alderman followed by tommy and a little terrier dog that was a great pet of his master went to the grand dwelling of the mayor the mayor also had a little terrier dog which was very fond of him and followed him wherever he went when tommy and the alderman reached the mayor's house the mayor met them at the door and said tommy i am going up the street and the alderman is going in the opposite direction i want you to keep our dogs from following us but you must not do it by holding them very well sir replied tommy and as the mayor started one way and the alderman the other he took out his handkerchief and tied the tails of the two dogs together of course each dog started to follow its master but as they were about the same size and strength and each pulled in a different direction the result was that they remained in one place and could not move either one way or the other that was well done said the mayor coming back again but tell me can you put my cart before my horse and take me for a ride certainly sir replied tommy and going to the mayor's stable he put the harness on the nag and then led him head first into the shafts instead of backing him into them as is the usual way after fastening the shafts to the horse he mounted upon the animal's back and away they started pushing the cart before the horse that was easy said tommy if your honor will get into the cart i'll take you to ride but the mayor did not ride although he was pleased at tommy's readiness in solving a difficulty after a moment's thought he bade tommy follow him into the house where he gave him a cupful of water saying let me see you drink up this cup of water tommy hesitated a moment for he knew the mayor was trying to catch him then going to a corner of the room he set down the cup and stood upon his head in the corner he now carefully raised the cup to his lips and slowly drank the water until the cup was empty after this he regained his feet and bowing politely to the mayor he said the water is drunk up your honor but why did you stand on your head to do it inquired the alderman who had watched the act in astonishment because otherwise i would have drunk the water down and not up replied tommy the mayor was now satisfied that tommy was shrewd enough to do him honor so he immediately took him to live in the great house as his adopted son and he was educated by the best masters the city afforded and tommy tucker became after years not only a great but a good man and before he died was himself mayor of the city and was known by the name of sir thomas tucker end of the story of tommy tucker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pussycat Mew from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Pussycat, Pussycat, where do you go? To London, to visit the palace, you know. Pussycat Mew, while you come back again? Oh, yes, I'll scamper with might and with main. Pussycat Mew set off on her way, stepping quite softly and feeling quite gay. Smooth was the road, so she traveled at ease, warmed by the sunshine and fanned by the breeze. Over the hills to the valleys below, through the deep woods where the soft mosses grow, skirting the fields with buttercups dotted, Swiftly our venturesome pussycat trotted. Sharp watch she kept when a village she neared, For boys and their mischief our pussycat feared. Oft she crept through the grasses so deep To pass by a dog that was lying asleep. Once, as she walked through a sweet clover field, Something beside her affrightedly squealed, And swift from her path there darted away A tiny field mouse with a coat of soft gray. Nowhere, thought our pussy, is chance for a dinner. The one that runs fastest must surely be winner. 
so quickly she started the mouse to give chase, and over the clover they ran a great race. But just when it seemed that Pussy would win, the mouse spied a hole and quickly popped in. And so he escaped, for the hole was so small that Pussy Cat couldn't squeeze in it at all. So softly she crouched, and with eyes big and round, quite steadily watched that small hole in the ground. This mouse really thinks he's escaped me, she said. But I'll catch him sure if he sticks out his head. But while she was watching the poor mouse's plight, a deep growl behind made her jump with a fright. She gave a great cry and then started to run as swift as a bullet that shot from a gun. Meow, meow, our poor puss did say. Bow, wow cried the dog, who was not far away. O'er meadows and ditches they scampered apace, O'er fences and hedges they kept up the race. Then Pussycat Mew saw before her a tree, And knew that a safe place of refuge t'would be. So far up the tree with a bound she did go, And left the big dog to growl down below. But now, by good fortune, a man came that way And called to the dog who was forced to obey. But Puss did not come down the tree till she knew that the man and the dog were far out of view. Pursuing her way, at nightfall she came to London, a town you know well by name. And wandering round in byway and street, a strange pussy cat she happened to meet. Good evening, said Pussy Cat Mew. Can you tell in which of these houses the queen may now dwell? I'm a stranger in town, and I'm anxious to see what sort of a person a real queen may be. My friend, said the other, you really must know it isn't permitted that strangers should go inside of the palace, unless they're invited, and strange pussycats are apt to be slighted. By good luck, however, I'm quite well aware of a way to the palace by means of a stair that never is guarded, so just come with me and a glimpse of the queen you shall certainly see. Puss thanked her new friend, and together they stole to the back of the palace, and crept through a hole in the fence, and quietly came to the stair which the stranger pussy-cat promised was there. Now here I must leave you, the strange pussy said, so don't be afraid, cat, but go straight ahead, and don't be alarmed if by chance you are seen, for people will think you belong to the queen. So Pussycat Mew did as she had been told, and walked through the palace with a manner so bold. She soon reached the room where the queen sat in state, surrounded by lords and by ladies so great. And there in the corner our pussy sat down, and gazed at the scepter, and blinked at the crown, and eyed the queen's dress, all purple and gold, which was surely a beautiful sight to behold. But all of a sudden she started, for there was a little gray mouse right under the chair where Her Majesty sat, and Pussy well knew she'd scream with alarm if the mouse met her view. So up toward the chair our pussycat stole, but the mouse saw her coming and ran for its hole, but Pussy ran after, and during the race a wonderful, terrible panic took place. The ladies all jumped on their chairs in alarm, the lords drew their swords to protect them from harm. And the queen gave a scream and fainted away. A very undignified act, I must say. And someone cried, Burglars! And someone cried, Treason! And someone cried, Murder! But none knew the reason. And someone cried, Fire! They are burning the house! And someone cried, Silence! It's only a mouse! But Pussycat Mew was so awfully scared by the shouting and screaming, no longer she dared to stay in the room, so without more delay she rushed from the palace and scampered away. So bristling her fur and with heart beating fast, she came to the road leading homeward at last. What business, she thought, has a poor country cat to visit a city of madmen like that? Straight homeward I'll go, where I am well fed, where mistress is kind, and soft is my bed. Let other cats travel if they wish to roam. But as for myself, I shall now stay at home. 
and over the hills and valleys she ran, and journeyed as fast as a pussycat can, till just as the dawn of the day did begin, she safely at home stole quietly in. And there was the fire with the pot boiling on it, and there was the maid in the blue checkered bonnet, and there was the corner where pussy oft basked, and there was the mistress, who eagerly asked, Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to visit the queen. Pussycat, Pussycat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under her chair. End of Pussycat Mew This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Charlene Harris. Email soundchest at yahoo.com. How the Beggars Came to Town from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. How the Beggars Came to Town. Hark, hark, the dogs do bark. The beggars are coming to town. Some in rags and some in tags, and some in velvet gown. Very fair and sweet was little Prince Lillimond, and few could resist his soft pleading voice and gentle blue eyes, as he stood in the presence of the king his father, and bent his knee gracefully before his majesty, the act was so courteous and dignified it would have honoured the oldest nobleman of the court. The king was delighted, and for a time sat silently regarding his son and noting every detail of his appearance, from the dark velvet suit with its dainty ruffles and collar, to the diamond buckles on the little shoes, and back again to the flowing curls that clustered thick about the bright childish face. Well might any father be proud of so manly and beautiful a child, and the king's heart swelled within him as he gazed upon his heir. Borland, he said to the tutor, who stood modestly behind the prince, you may retire. I wish to speak privately with His Royal Highness." The tutor bowed low and disappeared within the anteroom, and the king continued kindly. "'Come here, Lillimond, and sit beside me. Methinks you seem over-grave this morning.' "'It is my birthday, Your Majesty,' replied the prince, as he slowly obeyed his father, and sat beside him upon the rich broidered cushions of the throne. "'I am twelve years of age.' "'So old?' said the king, smiling into the little face that was raised to his. And is it the weight of years that makes you sad? No, your majesty, I long for the years to pass, that I may become a man and take my part in the world's affairs. It is the sad condition of my country which troubles me. Indeed? exclaimed the king, casting a keen glance at his son. Are you becoming interested in politics, then, or is there some grievous breach of court etiquette which has attracted your attention? I know little of politics, and less of the court, sire, replied Lillimond. It is the distress of the people that worries me. The people? Of a surety, Prince, you are better posted than I am, since of the people and their affairs I know nothing at all. I have appointed officers to look after their interests, and therefore I have no cause to come into contact with them myself. But what is amiss? They are starving, said the prince, looking at his father very seriously. The country is filled with beggars who appeal for charity, since they are unable otherwise to procure food. Starving? repeated the king. Surely you are misinformed. My lord Chamberlain told me but this morning the people were loyal and contented, and my lord of the treasury reports that all taxes and tithes have been paid, and my coffers are running over. "'Your Lord Chamberlain is wrong, sire,' returned the prince. "'My tutor, Borland, and I have talked with many of these beggars these past few days, and we find the tithes and taxes which have enriched you have taken the bread from their wives and children.' "'So,' exclaimed the king, "'we must examine into this matter.' He touched a bell beside him, and when a retainer appeared directed his chamberlain and his treasurer to wait upon him at once. The prince rested his head upon his hand and waited patiently, but the king was very impatient indeed till the high officers of the court stood before him. Then said the king, addressing his chamberlain, Sir, I am informed my people are murmuring at my injustice. Is it true? 
The officer cast an inquiring glance at the prince, who met his eyes gravely before he replied. The people always murmur, Your Majesty. They are many, and not all can be content, even when ruled by so wise and just a king. In every land, and in every age, there are those who rebel against the laws, and the protests of the few are ever heard above the contentment of the many. I am told, continued the king severely, that my country is overrun with beggars who suffer for the lack of bread we have taken from them by our taxations. Is this true? There are always beggars, your majesty, in every country, replied the chamberlain, and it is their custom to blame others for their own misfortunes. The king thought deeply for a moment, then he turned to the lord of the treasury. Do we tax the poor? he demanded. All are taxed, sire, returned the treasurer, who was pale from anxiety, for never before had the king so questioned him. But from the rich we take much, from the poor very little. But a little from a poor man may distress him, while the rich subject would never feel the loss. Why do we tax the poor at all? Because, your majesty, should we declare the poor free from taxation, all your subjects would at once claim to be poor, and the royal treasury would remain empty. And as none are so rich, but there are those richer, how should we, in justice, determine which are the rich and which are the poor? Again the king was silent while he pondered upon the words of the royal treasurer. Then with a wave of his hand he dismissed them and turned to the prince, saying, You have heard the wise words of my counsellors, prince. What have you to say in reply? If you will pardon me, your majesty, I think you are wrong to leave the affairs of the people to others to direct. If you knew them as well as I do, you would distrust the words of your counsellors, who naturally fear your anger more than they do that of your subjects. If they fear my anger, they will be careful to do no injustice to my people. Surely you cannot expect me to attend to levying the taxes myself, continued the king with growing annoyance. What are my officers for but to serve me? They should serve you, it is true replied the prince thoughtfully, but they should serve the people as well. Nonsense, answered the king. You are too young as yet to properly understand such matters, and it is a way youth has to imagine it is wiser than age and experience combined. Still, I will investigate the subject further and see that justice is done the poor. In the meantime, said the prince, many will starve to death. Can you not assist these poor beggars at once? In what way? demanded the king, by giving the money from your coffers. Nonsense! again cried the king, this time with real anger. You have heard what the chamberlain said. We always have beggars, and none as yet have starved to death. Besides, I must use the money for the grand ball and tourney next month, as we have promised the ladies of the court a carnival of unusual magnificence. The prince did not reply to this, but remained in silent thought wondering what he might do to ease the suffering he feared existed on every hand amongst the poor of the kingdom. He had hoped to persuade the king to assist these beggars, but since the interview with the officers of the court he had lost heart, and despaired of influencing his royal father in any way. Suddenly the king spoke. Let us dismiss this subject, Lillemond, for it only serves to distress us both, and no good can come of it. You have nearly made me forget it is your birthday. Now listen, my son, I am much pleased with you, and thank God that he has given me such a successor for my crown, for I perceive your mind is as beautiful as your person, and that you will in time be fitted to rule the land with wisdom and justice. Therefore I promise, in honor of your birthday, to grant any desire you may express, provided it lies within my power. Nor will I make any further condition, since I rely upon your judgment to select some gift I may be glad to bestow. As the king spoke, Lillamond suddenly became impressed with an idea through which he might sister the poor, and therefore he answered, Call in the ladies and gentlemen of the court, my father, and before them all I will claim your promise. Good, exclaimed the king, who looked for some amusement in his son's request, and at once he ordered the court to assemble. The ladies and gentlemen, as they filed into the audience chamber, were astonished to see the prince seated upon the throne beside his sire. But being too well bred to betray their surprise, they only wondered what amusement his majesty had in store for them. When all were assembled, the prince rose to his feet and addressed them. 
His Majesty the King, whose kindness of heart and royal condescension is well known to you all, hath but now promised me, seeing that it is my birthday, to grant any one request that I may prefer. Is it not true, Your Majesty? It is true answered the king, smiling upon his son, and pleased to see him addressing the court so gravely and with so manly an air. Whatever the prince may ask, that will I freely grant. Then, O sire, said the prince, kneeling before the throne, I ask that for the period of one day I may reign as king in your stead, having at my command all kingly power and the obedience of all who owe allegiance to the crown. For a time there was perfect silence in the court. The king, growing red with dismay and embarrassment, and the courtiers, waiting curiously his reply, Lilliman still remained kneeling before the throne, and as the king looked upon him he realized it would be impossible to break his royal word. And the affair promised him amusement after all, so he quickly decided in what manner to reply. Rise, O prince, he said, cheerfully, your request is granted. Upon what day will it please you to reign? Lilliment arose to his feet. Upon the seventh day from this, he answered. So be it, returned the king. Then turning to the royal herald, he added, Make proclamation throughout the kingdom that on the seventh day from this Prince Lillimond will reign as king from sunrise till sunset, and whoever dares to disobey his commands will be guilty of treason and shall be punished with death. The court was then dismissed, all wondering at this marvellous decree, and the prince returned to his own apartment, where his tutor Borland anxiously awaited him. Now this Borland was a man of good heart and much intelligence, but wholly unused to the ways of the world. He had lately noted with much grief the number of beggars who solicited alms as he walked out with the prince, and he had given freely until his purse was empty. Then he talked long and earnestly with the prince concerning this shocking condition in the kingdom, never dreaming that his own generosity had attracted all the beggars of the city toward him, and encouraged them to become more bold than usual. Thus was the young and tender-hearted prince brought to a knowledge of all these beggars, and therefore it was that their condition filled him with sadness, and induced him to speak so boldly to the king, his father. When he returned to Borland with the tidings that the king had granted him permission to rule for a day the kingdom, the tutor was overjoyed, and at once they began to plan ways for relieving all the poor of the country in that one day. For one thing, they dispatched private messages to every part of the kingdom, bidding them tell each beggar they met to come to the prince on that one day he should be king, and he would relieve their wants, giving a broad gold piece to every poor man or woman who asked. For the prince had determined to devote to this purpose the gold that filled the royal coffers, and as for the great ball and tourney the king had planned, why, that could go begging much better than the starving people. On the night before the day the prince was to reign there was a great confusion of noise within the city, for beggars from all parts of the kingdom began to arrive, each one filled with joy at the prospect of receiving a piece of gold. There was a continual tramp, tramp of feet, and a great barking of dogs. As all dogs in those days were trained to bark at every beggar they saw, and now it was difficult to restrain them. And the beggars came to town singingly and by twos and threes, until hundreds were there to await the morrow. Some few were very pitiful to behold, being feeble and infirm from age and disease, dressed in rags and tags and presenting an appearance of great distress. But there were many more who were seemingly hardy and vigorous and these were the lazy ones who, not being willing to work, begged for a livelihood. And some there were dressed in silken hose and velvet gowns, who, forgetting all shame and eager for gold, had been led by the prince's offer to represent themselves as beggars, that they might add to their wealth without trouble or cost to themselves. The next morning, when the sun arose upon the eventful day, it found the prince sitting upon the throne of his father, dressed in a robe of ermine and purple a crown upon his flowing locks, and the king's sceptre clasped tightly in his little hand. He was somewhat frightened at the clamor of the crowd without the palace, but Borland, who stood behind him, whispered, The more you can susser, the greater will be your glory, and you will live in the hearts of your people as the king prince who relieved their sufferings. Be of good cheer, your majesty, for all is well. 
Then did the prince command the treasurer to bring before him the royal coffers, and to stand ready to present to each beggar a piece of gold. The treasurer was very unwilling to do this, but he was under penalty of death if he refused, and so the coffers were brought forth. "'Your Majesty,' said the treasurer, "'if each of those who clamour without is to receive a piece of gold, "'there will not be enough within these coffers to go around. "'Some will receive and others be denied, "'since no further store of gold is to be had.' "'At this news the prince was both puzzled and alarmed. "'What are we to do?' he asked of the tutor, "'but Borland was unable to suggest a remedy.' Then said the aged chamberlain, coming forward and bowing low before the little king, Your Majesty, I think I can assist you in your difficulty. You did but promise a piece of gold to those who are really suffering and in need. But so great is the greed of mankind that many without are in no necessity whatever, but only seek to enrich themselves at your expense. Therefore I propose you examine carefully each case that presents itself, and, unless the beggar is in need of alms, turn him away empty-handed, as being a fraud and a charlatan. "'Your counsel is wise, O Chamberlain,' replied the prince, after a moment's thought, "'and by turning away the impostors we shall have gold enough for the needy. Therefore bid the guards to admit the beggars one by one.' When the first beggar came before him, the prince asked, "'Are you in need?' "'I am starving, Your Majesty.' replied the man in a whining tone. He was poorly dressed, but seemed strong and well, and the prince examined him carefully for a moment. Then he answered the fellow, saying, Since you are starving, go and sell the gold ring I see you are wearing upon your finger. I can assist only those who are unable to help themselves. At this the man turned away, muttering angrily, and the courtiers murmured their approval of the prince's wisdom. The next beggar was dressed in velvet, and the prince sent him away with a sharp rebuke. But the third was a woman old and feeble, and she blessed the prince as she hobbled joyfully away with a broad gold piece clasped tightly within her withered hand. The next told so pitiful a story that he also received a gold piece, but as he turned away the prince saw that beneath his robe his shoes were fastened with silver buckles, and so he commanded the guards to take away the gold and to punish the man for attempting to deceive his king. And so many came to him that were found to be unworthy that he finally bade the guards proclaim to all who waited that any who should be found undeserving would be beaten with stripes. That edict so frightened the imposers that they quickly fled, and only those few who were actually in want dared to present themselves before the king and lo, the task that had seemed too great for one day was performed in a few hours, and when all the needy had been provided for, but one of the royal coffers had been opened, and that was scarcely empty. "'What do you think, Borland?' asked the prince, anxiously. "'Have we done all right?' "'I have learned, Your Majesty,' answered the tutor, "'that there is a great difference between those who beg and those who suffer for lack of bread. For." While all who needed aid were in truth beggars, not all the beggars needed aid, and hereafter I shall only give alms to those I know to be honestly in want. It is wisely said, my friend, returned the prince, and I feel I was wrong to doubt the wisdom of my father's counsellors. Go, Borland, and ask the king if he will graciously attend me here. The king arrived and bowed smilingly before the prince whom he had set to reign in his own place and at once the boy arose and presented his sire with the sceptre and crown, saying, Forgive me, O my king, that I presume to doubt the wisdom of your rule, for though the sun has not yet set, I feel that I am all unworthy to sit in your place, and so I willingly resign my power to your more skilful hands, and the coffers which I, in my ignorance, had determined to empty for the benefit of those unworthy, are still nearly full, and more than enough remains for the expenses of the carnival, Therefore, forgive me, my father, and let me learn wisdom in the future from the justness of your rule. Thus ended the reign of Prince Lillamund as king, and not till many years later did he again ascend the throne upon the death of his father. And really there was not much suffering in the kingdom at any time, as it was a prosperous country and well governed, for if you look for beggars in any land you will find many, but if you look only for the deserving poor there are less, and these all the more worthy of Susser. 
I wish all those in power were as kind-hearted as little Prince Lilliment, and as ready to help the needy, for then there would be light hearts in the world, since it is better to give than to receive. End of How the Beggars Came to Town This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom the Piper's Son From Mother Goose in Prose By L. Frank Baum Tom, Tom the Piper's Son stole a pig, and away he run. The pig was eat, and Tom was beat, and Tom ran crying down the street. There was not a worse vagabond in Shrewsbury than old Barney the Piper. He never did any work except to play the pipes, and he played so badly that few pennies ever found their way into his pouch. It was whispered around that old Barney was not very honest, but he was so sly and cautious that no one had ever caught him in the act of stealing, although a good many things had been missed after they had fallen into the old man's way. Barney had one son named Tom, and they lived all alone in a little hut away at the end of the village street, for Tom's mother had died when he was a baby. You may not suppose that Tom was a very good boy, since he had such a queer father, but neither was he very bad, and the worst fault he had was in obeying his father's wishes, when Barney wanted him to steal a chicken for their supper, or a pot of potatoes for their breakfast. Tom did not like to steal, but he had no one to teach him to be honest, and so, under his father's guidance, he fell into bad ways. One morning, Tom Tom the piper's son was hungry when the day begun. He wanted a bun and asked for one, but soon found out that there were none. "'What shall we do?' he asked his father. "'Go hungry,' replied Barney, "'unless you want to take my pipes and play in the village. Perhaps they will give you a penny.' No, answered Tom, shaking his head. No one will give me a penny for playing, but Farmer Bowser might give me a penny to stop playing if I went to his house. He did last week, you know. You'd better try it, said his father. It's mighty uncomfortable to be hungry. So Tom took his father's pipes and walked over the hill to Farmer Bowser's house. For you must know that Tom Tom the piper's son learned to play when he was young, but the only tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. And he played this one tune as badly as his father himself played, so that the people were annoyed when they heard him, and often begged him to stop. When he came to Farmer Bowser's house, Tom started up the pipes, and began to play with all his might. The farmer was in his woodshed sawing wood, so he did not hear the pipes. And the farmer's wife was deaf, and could not hear them, but a little pig that had strayed around in front of the house heard the noise and ran away in great fear to the pigsty. Then, as Tom saw the playing did no good, he thought he would sing also, and therefore he began bawling at the top of his voice. Over the hills, not a great ways off, the woodchuck died with a whooping cough. The farmer had stopped sawing to rest just then, and when he heard the singing, he rushed out of the shed and chased Tom away with a big stick of wood. The boy went back to his father and said sorrowfully, for he was more hungry than before, The farmer gave me nothing but a scolding, but there was a very nice pig running around the yard. How big was it? asked Barney. Oh, just about big enough to make a nice dinner for you and me. The piper slowly shook his head. Tis long since I on pig have fed. And though I feel it's wrong to steal, roast pig is very nice, he said. Tom knew very well what he meant by that, so he laid down the pipes and went back to the farmer's house. When he came near, he heard the farmer again sawing wood in the woodshed, and so he went softly up to the pigsty and reached over and grabbed the little pig by the ears. The pig squealed, of course, but the farmer was making so much noise himself that he did not hear it and in a minute Tom had the pig tucked under his arm and was running back home with it. The piper was very glad to see the pig and said to Tom, You are a good son, and the pig is very nice and fat. We shall have a dinner fit for a king. 
It was not long before the piper had the pig killed and cut into pieces and boiling in the pot. Only the tail was left out, for Tom wanted to make a whistle of it, and as there was plenty to eat besides the tail, his father let him have it. The piper and his son had a fine dinner that day, and so great was their hunger that the little pig was all eaten up at one meal. Then Barney lay down to sleep, and Tom sat on a bench outside the door and began to make a whistle out of the pig's tail with his pocket knife. Now Farmer Bowser, when he had finished sawing the wood, found it was time to feed the pig. So he took a pail of meal and went to the pigsty. But when he came to the sty, there was no pig to be seen, and he searched all round the place for a good hour without finding it. Piggy, 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 he called, but no piggy came and then he knew his pig had been stolen. He was very angry indeed, for the pig was a great pet, and he had wanted to keep it till it grew very big. So he put on his coat and buckled a strap around his waist, and went down to the village to see if he could find out who had stolen his pig. Up and down the street he went, and in and out the lanes, but no traces of the pig could he find anywhere. And that was no great wonder, for the pig was eaten by that time, and its bones picked clean. Finally the farmer came to the end of the street, where the piper lived in his little hut, and there he saw Tom sitting on a bench and blowing on a whistle made from a pig's tail. "'Where did you get that tail?' asked the farmer. "'I found it,' said naughty Tom, beginning to be frightened. "'Let me see it,' demanded the farmer, and when he had looked at it carefully he cried out, this tail belonged to my little pig, for I know very well the curl at the end of it. Tell me, you rascal, where is the pig? Then Tom fell in a tremble, for he knew his wickedness was discovered. The pig is eat, your honor, he answered. The farmer said never a word, but his face grew black with anger, and unbuckling the strap that was about his waist, he waved it around his head, and whack! came the strap over Tom's back. "'Ow! Ow!' cried the boy, and started to run down the street. "'Whack! Whack!' fell the strap over his shoulder, for the farmer followed at his heels halfway down the street, nor did he spare the strap until he had given Tom a good beating, and Tom was so scared that he never stopped running until he came to the end of the village, and he bawled lustily the whole way and cried out at every step, as if the farmer was still at his back." It was dark before he came back to his home, and his father was still asleep, so Tom crept into the hut and went to bed. But he had received a good lesson, and never after that could the old piper induce him to steal. When Tom showed by his actions his intention of being honest, he soon got a job of work to do, and before long he was able to earn a living more easily, and a great deal more honestly, than when he stole the pig to get a dinner and suffered a severe beating as a punishment. Tom Tom the piper's son, now with stealing pigs was done, he'd work all day instead of play, and dined on tart and currant bun. End of Tom the Piper's Son This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humpty Dumpty from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty together again. At the very top of the haymow in the barn, the speckled hen had made her nest, and each day for twelve days she had laid in it a pretty white egg. The speckled hen had made her nest in this out-of-the-way place, so that no one would come to disturb her, as it was her intention to sit upon the eggs until they were hatched into chickens. Each day, as she laid her eggs, she would cackle to herself, saying, This will in time be a beautiful chick, with soft fluffy down all over its body, and bright little eyes that will look at the world in amazement. It will be one of my children, and I shall love it dearly. 
She named each egg as she laid it by the name she should call it when a chick, the first one being Cluckety Cluck, and the next Kadaukuk, and so on. And when she came to the twelfth egg, she called it Humpty Dumpty. This twelfth egg was remarkably big and white, and of a very pretty shape, and as the nest was now so full, she laid it quite near the edge. And then the speckled hen, after looking proudly at her work, went off to the barnyard, clucking joyfully in search of something to eat. When she had gone, Cluckety Cluck, who was in the middle of the nest, and the oldest egg of all, called out angrily, "'It's getting crowded in this nest. Move up there, some of you fellows.' And then he gave Kadakut, who was above him, a kick. "'I can't move unless the others do. They're crowding me down,' said Kadakut, and he kicked the egg next above him. And so they continued kicking one another and rolling around in the nest until one kicked Humpty Dumpty, and as he lay on the edge of the nest, he was kicked out and rolled down the haymow until he came to a stop near the very bottom. Humpty did not like this very well, but he was a bright egg for one so young, and after he had recovered from his shaking up, he began to look about to see where he was. The barn door was open, and he caught a glimpse of trees and hedges and green grass with a silvery brook running through it and he saw the waving grain and the tasseled maize and the sunshine flooding it all. The scene was very enticing to the young egg, and Humpty at once resolved to see something of this great world before going back to the nest. He began to make his way carefully through the hay, and was getting along fairly well when he heard a voice say, "'Where are you going?' Humpty looked around and found he was beside a pretty little nest in which was one brown egg. "'Did you speak?' he asked. "'Yes,' replied the brown egg. "'I asked where you were going.' "'Who are you?' inquired Humpty. "'Do you belong in our nest?' "'Oh, no,' answered the brown egg. "'My name is Kuchikulu, and the black bantam laid me about an hour ago.' "'Oh!' said Humpty proudly. I belong to the speckled hen myself. Do you indeed? returned Kuchikulu. I saw her go by a little while ago, and she's much bigger than a black bantam. Yes, and I'm much bigger than you, replied Humpty. But I'm going out to see the world, and if you'd like to go with me, I'll take good care of you. Isn't it dangerous for eggs to go about all by themselves? asked Kuchik timidly. "'Perhaps so,' answered Humpty. "'But it's dangerous in the nest, too. My brothers might have smashed me with their kicking. However, if we are careful, we can't come to much harm. So come along, little one, and I'll look after you.' Kuchikulu gave him her hand while he helped her out of the nest, and together they crept over the hay until they came to the barn floor. They made for the door at once, holding each other by the hand, and soon came to the threshold, which appeared very high to them. "'We must jump,' said Humpty. "'I'm afraid,' cried Kuchikulu. "'And I declare, there's my mother's voice clucking. She's coming this way.' "'Then hurry,' said Humpty, "'and do not tremble so, or you will get yourself all mixed up. It doesn't improve eggs to shake them. We will jump.' but take care not to bump against me, or you may break my shell. Now, one, two, three. They held each other's hand and jumped, alighting safely in the roadway. Then, fearing their mothers would see them, Humpty ran as fast as he could until he and Coochie were concealed beneath a rosebud in the garden. I am afraid we're bad eggs, gasped Coochie who was somewhat out of breath. "'Oh, not at all,' replied Humpty. "'We were laid only this morning, so we are quite fresh. "'But now, since we are in the world, "'we must start out in search of adventure. "'Here is a roadway beside us, "'which will lead somewhere or other, 
so come along, Kuchikalu, and do not be afraid. The brown egg meekly gave him her hand, and together they trotted along the roadway until they came to a high stone wall, which had sharp spikes upon its top. It seemed to extend for a great distance, and the egg stopped and looked at it curiously. "'I'd like to see what is behind that wall,' said Humpty, "'but I don't think we shall be able to climb up over it.' "'No, indeed,' answered the brown egg, "'but just before us I see a little hole in the wall, near the ground. Perhaps we can crawl through that. They ran to the hole, and found it was just large enough to admit them. So they squeezed through very carefully, in order not to break themselves, and soon came to the other side. They were now in the most beautiful garden, with trees and brightly hued flowers, in abundance and pretty fountains that shot their merry sprays far into the air. In the center of the garden was a great palace, with bright golden turrets and domes, and many windows that glistened in the sunshine like the sparkle of diamonds. Richly dressed courtiers and charming ladies strolled through the walks, and before the palace door were a dozen prancing horses, gaily caparisoned, awaiting their riders. It was a scene brilliant enough to fascinate anyone, and the two eggs stood spellbound while their eyes feasted upon the unusual sight. See, whispered Kuchikulu, there are some birds swimming in the water yonder. Let us go and look at them, for we may also be birds some day. True, answered Humpty, but we are just as likely to be omelets or angel's food. Still, we will have a look at the birds. So they started to cross the drive on the way to the pond, never noticing that the king and his courtiers had issued from the palace, and were now coming down the drive riding upon their prancing steeds. Just as the eggs were in the middle of the drive, the horses dashed by, and Humpty, greatly alarmed, ran as fast as he could for the grass. Then he stopped and looked around, and behold, there was poor Kuchikulu crushed into a shapeless mass by the hoof of one of the horses, and her golden heart was spreading itself slowly over the white gravel of the driveway. Humpty sat down upon the grass and wept grievously, for the death of his companion was a great blow to him. And while he sobbed, a voice said to him, What is the matter, little egg? Humpty looked up and saw a beautiful girl bending over him. One of the horses has stepped upon Kuchikulu, he said, and now she is dead and I have no friend in all the world. The girl laughed. Do not grieve, she said for eggs are but short-lived creatures at best, and Kuchikulu has at least died an honorable death and saved herself from being fried in a pan or boiled in her own shell. So cheer up, little egg, and I will be your friend, at least so long as you remain fresh. A stale egg I never could abide. I was late only this morning, said Humpty, drying his tears, so you need have no fear. But don't call me Little Egg, for I am quite large as eggs go, and I have a name of my own. What is your name? asked the princess. It is Humpty Dumpty, he answered proudly. And now, if you will really be my friend, pray show me about the grounds and through the palace, and take care I am not crushed. So the princess took Humpty in her arms and walked with him all through the grounds, letting him see the fountains and the golden fish that swam in their waters, the bed of lilies and roses, and the pools where the swans floated. Then she took him into the palace and showed him all the gorgeous rooms, including the king's own bedchamber, and the room where stood the great ivory throne. Humpty sighed with pleasure. After this, he said, I am content to accept any fate that may befall me, for surely no egg before me ever saw so many beautiful sights. That is true, answered the princess, 
but now I have one more sight to show you which will be grander than all the others, for the king will be riding home shortly with all his horses and men at his back, and I will take you to the gates and let you see them pass by. Thank you, said Humpty. So she carried him to the gates, and while they awaited the coming of the king, the egg said, Put me upon the wall, princess, for then I be able to see much better than in your arms. That is a good idea, she answered, but you must be careful not to fall. Then she sat the egg gently upon the top of the stone wall, where there was a little hollow, and Humpty was delighted, for from his elevated perch he could see much better than the princess herself. "'Here they come!' he cried, and, sure enough, the king came riding along the road with many courtiers and soldiers and vassals following in his wake, all mounted upon the finest horses the kingdom could afford. As they came to the gate and entered at a brisk trot, Humpty, forgetting his dangerous position, leaned eagerly over to look at them. The next instant the princess heard a sharp crash at her side, and looking downward, perceived poor Humpty Dumpty, who lay crushed and mangled among the sharp stones where he had fallen. The princess sighed, for she had taken quite a fancy to the egg, but she knew it was impossible to gather it up again, or to mend the matter in any way, and therefore she returned thoughtfully to the palace. Now it happened that upon this evening several young men of the kingdom, who were all of high rank, had determined to ask the king for the hand of the princess. So they assembled in the throne room, and demanded that the king choose which of them was most worthy to marry his daughter. The king was in a quandary, for all the suitors were wealthy and powerful, and he feared that all but the one chosen would become his enemies. Therefore he thought long upon the matter, and at last said, where all are worthy, it is difficult to decide which most deserves the hand of the princess. Therefore, I propose to test your wit. The one who shall ask me a riddle I cannot guess can marry my daughter. At this the young men looked thoughtful, and began to devise riddles that his majesty should be unable to guess. But the king was a shrewd monarch and each one of the riddles presented to him he guessed with ease. Now, there was one amongst the suitors whom the princess herself favored, as was but natural. He was a slender, fair-haired youth, with dreamy blue eyes and a rosy complexion, and although he loved the princess dearly, he despaired of finding a riddle that the king could not guess. But while he stood leaning against the wall, the princess approached him and whispered in his ear a riddle she had just thought of. Instantly his face brightened, and when the king called, Now, Master Gracington, for it is your turn, he advanced boldly to the throne. Speak your riddle, sir, said the king, gaily, for he thought this youth would also fail, and that he might therefore keep the princess by his side for a time longer. But Master Gracington, with downcast eyes, knelt before the throne and spoke in this wise. This is my riddle, O king. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty together again. Read me that, sire, and you will. The king thought earnestly for a long time and he slapped his head and rubbed his ears and walked the floor in great strides, but guessed the riddle he could not. "'You are a humbug, sir,' he cried out at last. "'There is no answer to such a riddle.' "'You are wrong, sire,' answered the young man. "'Humpty Dumpty was an egg.' "'Why did I not think of that before?' exclaimed the king. But he gave the princess to the young man to be his bride, and they lived happily together. And thus did Humpty Dumpty, even in his death, repay the kindness of the fair girl who had shown him such sights as an egg seldom sees. End of Humpty Dumpty
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christiane Levesque from Two Girls on a Podcast at Two Girls on a Podcast. .com. The Woman Who Lived in the Shoe from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. The Woman Who Lived in a Shoe There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread, and whipped them all soundly, and sent them to bed. A long time ago there lived a woman who had four daughters, and these in time grew up and married and went to live in different parts of the country. And the woman, after that, lived all alone, and said to herself, I have done my duty to the world, and now shall rest quietly for the balance of my life. When one has raised a family of four children, and has married them all happily, she is surely entitled to pass her remaining days in peace and comfort. She lived in a peculiar little house that looked something like this picture. It was not like most of the houses you see, but the old woman had it built herself and liked it, and so it did not matter to her how odd it was. It stood upon the top of a little hill, and there was a garden at the back, and had a pretty green lawn in front with white gravel paths and many beds of bright-colored flowers. The old woman was very happy and contented there until one day she received a letter saying that her daughter Hannah was dead and had sent her family of five children to their grandmother to be taken care of. This misfortune ruined all the old woman's dreams of quiet, but the next day the children arrived, three boys and two girls, and she made the best of it and gave them the beds her own daughters had once occupied and her own cot as well and she made a bed for herself on the parlor sofa. The youngsters were like all other children and got into mischief once in a while, but the old woman had much experience with children and managed to keep them in order very well, while they quickly learned to obey her, and generally did as they were bid. But scarcely had she succeeded in getting them settled in their new home when Margaret, another of her daughters, died, and sent four more children to her mother to be taken care of. The old woman scarcely knew where to keep this new flock that had come to her fold, for the house was already full. But she thought the matter over, and finally decided she must build an addition to her house. So she hired a carpenter, and built what is called a lean-to, at the right of her cottage, making it just big enough to accommodate the four new members of her family. When it was completed, her house looked very much like it does in this picture. She put four little cots in her new part of the house, and then she sighed contentedly and said, Now all the babies are taken care of and will be comfortable until they grow up. Of course, it was much more difficult to manage nine small children than five, and they often led each other into mischief, so that the flower beds began to be trampled upon, and the green grass to be worn under the constant tread of little feet, and the furniture to show a good many scratches and bruises. But the old woman continued to look after them, as well as she was able, until Sarah, her third daughter, also died, and three more children were sent to their grandmother to be brought up. The old woman was nearly distracted when she heard of this new addition to her family, but she did not give way to despair. She sent for the carpenter again, and had him built another addition to her house, as the picture shows. Then she put three new cots in the new part for the babies to sleep in, and when they arrived, they were just as cozy and comfortable as peas in a pod. The grandmother was a lively old woman for one of her years, but she found her time now fully occupied in cooking the meals for her twelve small grandchildren, and mending their clothes, and washing their faces, and undressing them at night, and dressing them in the morning. There was just a dozen of babies now, and when you consider they were about the same age, you will realize what a large family the old woman had, and how fully her time was occupied in caring for them all. And now, to make the matter worse, her fourth daughter, who had been named Abigail, suddenly took sick and died, and she also had four small children that must be cared for in some way. The old woman, having taken the other twelve, could not well refuse to adopt these little orphans also. I may as well have sixteen as a dozen, she said with a sigh. They will drive me crazy some day anyhow, so a few more will not matter at all. Once more she sent for the carpenter and bade him build a third addition to the house, and when it was completed she added four more cots to the dozen that were already in use. 
The house presented a very queer appearance now, but she did not mind that so long as the babies were comfortable. "'I shall not have to build again,' she said, "'and that is one satisfaction. I have now no more daughters to die and leave me their children, and therefore I must make up my mind to do the best I can with the sixteen that have already been inflicted upon me in my old age.' It was not long before all the grass about the house was trodden down, and the white gravel of the walks all thrown at the birds, and the flower beds trampled into shapeless masses by thirty-two little feet that ran about from morn till night. But the old woman did not complain at this. Her time was too much taken up with the babies for her to miss the grass and the flowers. It cost so much money to clothe them that she decided to dress them all alike, so that they looked like the children of a regular orphan asylum and it cost so much to feed them that she was obliged to give them the plainest food. So there was bread and milk for breakfast, and milk and bread for dinner, and bread and broth for supper. But it was a good and wholesome diet, and the children thrived and grew fat upon it. One day a stranger came along the road, and when he saw the old woman's house he began to laugh. "'What are you laughing at, sir?' asked the grandmother, who was sitting upon her doorstep, engaged in mending sixteen pairs of stockings. "'At your house,' the stranger replied. "'It looks for all the world like a big shoe.' "'A shoe,' she said in surprise. "'Why, yes. The chimneys are the shoe straps, and the steps are the heel, and all those additions make up the foot of the shoe.' "'Never mind,' said the woman.' It may be a shoe, but it is full of babies, and that makes it differ from most other shoes. But the stranger went on to the village and told all he met that he had seen an old woman who lived in a shoe, and soon people came from all parts of the country to look at the queer house, and they usually went away laughing. The old woman did not mind this at all. She was too busy to be angry. Some of the children were always getting bumped heads or bruised shins, or falling down and hurting themselves, and these had to be comforted and some were naughty and had to be whipped, and some were dirty and had to be washed, and some were good and had to be kissed. It was Grandma do this and Grandma do that from morning to night, so that the poor grandmother was nearly distracted. The only peace she ever got was when they were all safely tucked in their little cots and were sound asleep, for then at least she was free from worry and had a chance to gather her scattered wits. There are so many children, she said one day to the baker man, that I often really don't know what to do. If they were mine, ma'am, he replied, I'd send them to the poorhouse, or else they'd send me to the madhouse. Some of the children heard him say this, and they resolved to play him a trick in return for his ill-natured speech. The baker man came every day to the shoe house and brought two great baskets of bread in his arms for the children to eat with their milk and their broth. So one day, when the old woman had gone to town to buy shoes, the children all painted their faces to look as Indians do when they are on the warpath, and they caught the roosters and the turkey cock and pulled feathers from their tails to stick in their hair. And then the boys made wooden tomahawks for the girls and bows and arrows for their own use and then all sixteen went out and hid in the bushes near the top of the hill. By and by the baker man came slowly up the path with a basket of bread on either arm, and just as he reached the bushes there sounded in his ears the most unearthly war-hoop. Then a flight of arrows came from the bushes, and although they were blunt and could do him no harm, they rattled all over his body, and one hit his nose and another his chin, while several stuck fast in the loaves of bread. Altogether the baker man was terribly frightened, and when all the sixteen small Indians rushed from the bushes and flourished their tomahawks, he took to his heels and ran down the hill as fast as he could go. When the grandmother returned, she asked, "'Where is the bread for your supper?' The children looked at one another in surprise, for they had forgotten all about the bread. And then one of them confessed and told her the whole story of how they had frightened the baker man for saying he would send them to the poorhouse. "'You are sixteen very naughty children,' exclaimed the old woman, "'and for punishment you must eat your broth without any bread, and afterwards each one shall have a sound whipping and be sent to bed.' Then all the children began to cry at once, and there was such an uproar that their grandmother had to put cotton in her ears that she might not lose her hearing but she kept her promise and made them eat their broth without any bread 
for indeed there was no bread to give them. Then she stood them in a row and undressed them, and as she put the nightdress on each one she gave it a sound whipping and sent it to bed. They cried some, of course, but they knew very well they deserved the punishment, and it was not long before all of them were sound asleep. They took care not to play any more tricks on the baker man, and as they grew older they were naturally much better behaved. Before many years the boys were old enough to work for the neighboring farmers, and that made the woman's family a good deal smaller, and then the girls grew up and married, and found homes of their own, so that all the children were in time well provided for. But not one of them forgot the kind grandmother who had taken such good care of them, and often they tell their children of the days when they lived with the old woman in a shoe and frightened the baker man almost into fits with their wooden tomahawks. End of The Woman Who Lived in a Shoe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brennan Holtzclaw of Moberly, Missouri. Little Miss Muffet from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet, eating of curds and whey. There came a great spider and sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. Little Miss Muffet's father was a big banker in a big city, and he had so much money that the house he lived in was almost as beautiful as a king's palace. It was built of granite and marble and richly furnished with every luxury that money can buy. There was an army of servants about the house, and many of them had no other duties than to wait upon Miss Muffet, for the little girl was an only child, and therefore a personage of great importance. She had a maid to dress her hair, and a maid to bathe her, a maid to serve her at table, and a maid to tie her shoestrings, and several maids besides. And then there was Nurse Hollowegg, to look after all the maids and see they did their tasks properly. The child's father spent his days at his office and his evenings at his club. Her mother was a leader in society and therefore fully engaged from morning till night, from night till morn, so that little Miss Muffet seldom saw her parents and scarce knew them when she did see them. I have never known by what name she was christened. Perhaps she did not know herself, for everyone called her Miss Muffet, since she could remember. The servants spoke of her respectively as Miss Muffet. Mrs. Muffet would say at times, "'By the way, nurse, how is Miss Muffet getting along?' And Mr. Muffet, when he met his little daughter by chance on the walk or in a hallway, would stop and look at her and gravely say, "'So this is Miss Muffet. Well, how are you feeling, little one?' And then, without heeding her answer, he would walk away. "'Perhaps you think that Miss Muffet, surrounded by every luxury and with a dozen servants to wait upon her, was happy and contented.' but such was not the case. She wanted to run and romp, but they told her it was unladylike. She wished to play with other children, but none were rich enough to be proper associates for her. She longed to dig in the dirt in the garden, but Nurse Hollowegg was shocked at the very thought. So Miss Muffet became sullen and irritable, and scolded everyone about her, and lived a very unhappy life. And her food was too rich, and gave her dyspepsia, so that she grew thin and pale, and did not sleep well at night. One afternoon her mother, who happened to be at home for an hour, suddenly thought of her little daughter, so she rang the bell and asked for Nurse Hollowegg. "'How is Miss Muffet, nurse?' inquired the lady. "'Very badly, ma'am,' was the reply. "'Badly? What do you mean? Is she ill?' "'She's far from well, ma'am,' answered the nurse, "'and seems to be getting worse every day.' "'Well,' replied the lady, "'you must have the doctor see to her,' "'And don't forget to let me know what he says. "'That is all, nurse.' "'She turned to her novel again, "'and the nurse walked away "'and sent a servant for the doctor. "'The great man, when he came, "'shook his head solemnly and said, "'She must have a change. "'Take her away into the country as soon as possible.' "'And very good advice it was, too,' "'remarked the nurse to one of the maids, "'for I feel as if I needed a change myself.' "'When she reported the matter to Mrs. Muffet, "'the mother answered,' "'Very well. I will see Mr. Muffet and have him write out a check.' And so it was that a week later little Miss Muffet went to the country, 
or rather to a small town where there was a summer hotel that had been highly recommended to Nurse Holloweg, and with her went the strings of maids and a wagon load of boxes and trunks. The morning after their arrival, the little girl asked to go out upon the lawn. Well, replied Nurse Holloweg, Sarah can take you out for half an hour, but remember you are not to run and get heated, for that will ruin your complexion. You must not speak to any of the common children you meet, for your mother would object, and you must not get your shoes dusty nor your dress soiled, nor disobey Sarah in any way. Little Miss Muffet went out in a very angry and sulky mood. What's the use of being in the country, she thought, if I must act just as I did in the city? I hate Nurse Holloweg and Sarah and all the rest of them, and if I dared, I'd just, just run away. Indeed, a few minutes later, when Sarah had fallen asleep upon a bench under a big shade tree, Miss Muffet decided she would really run away for once in her life and see how it seemed. There was a pretty lane nearby, running between shady trees far out into the country, and, stealing softly away from Sarah's side, the little girl ran as fast as she could and never stopped until she was all out of breath. While she rested, she wondered what she would do next. A farmer came along, driving an empty cart. "'I'll catch on behind,' said Miss Muffet gleefully, "'just as I've seen the boys do in the city. Won't it be fun?' So she ran and caught on the end of the cart and actually climbed into it, falling all in a heap upon the straw that lay upon the bottom. But it didn't hurt her at all, and the next minute the farmer whipped up his horses and they went trotting along the lane, carrying Miss Muffet farther and farther away from hated Nurse Holloweg and the dreadful maids. She looked around upon the green fields and waving grain, and drew in deep breaths of the country air, and was happy for almost the first time in her little life. By and by she lay back upon the straw and fell asleep, and the farmer, who did not know she was in his cart, drove on for many miles, until at last he stopped at a small wooden farmhouse and jumped to the ground. A woman came to the door to greet him, and he said to her, "'Well, mother, we're home again, you see.' "'So I see,' she said. "'Did you bring my groceries?' "'Yes,' he replied, as he began to unharness the horses. "'They are in the cart.' So she came to the cart and looked within, and saw Miss Muffet, who was still asleep. "'Where did you get the little girl?' asked the farmer's wife in surprise. "'What little girl?' asked he. "'The one in the cart.' He came to the cart and looked in, and was as surprised as his wife. "'She must have climbed into the cart when I left the town,' he said. "'But waken her, wife, and we will hear what she has to say.' So the farmer's wife shook the girl by the arm, and Miss Muffet sat up in the cart and rubbed her eyes and wondered where she was. "'How come you in my cart?' asked the farmer. "'I caught on behind and climbed in,' answered the girl. "'What is your name, and where do you live?' inquired the farmer's wife. "'My name is Miss Muffet, and I live in a big city, but where I do not know.' And that was all she could tell them. So the woman said at last, "'We must keep her till someone comes to claim her, and she can earn her living by helping me make the cheese.' "'That will be nice,' said Miss Muffet, with a laugh, "'for Nurse Holloweg never lets me do anything, and I should like to help somebody do something.' So they led her into the house where the farmer's wife wondered at the fine texture of her dress and admired the golden chain that hung around her neck. "'Someone will surely come for her,' the woman said to her husband, "'for she is richly dressed and must belong to a family of some importance.' Nevertheless, when they had eaten dinner, for which little Miss Muffet had a wonderful appetite, the woman took her into the dairy and told her how she could assist her in curdling the milk and preparing it for the cheese press. "'Why, it's really fun to work,' said the girl at first. "'And I should like to live here always. I do hope Nurse Holloweg will not find me.' After a time, however, she grew weary and wanted to rest, but the woman had not yet finished her cheese-making, so she bade the girl keep at her tasks. "'It's time enough to rest when your work is done,' she said, "'and if you stay with me you must earn your board. "'No one is allowed to idle in this house.' So little Miss Muffet, though she felt like crying and was very tired, kept at her work until at length all was finished and the last cheese was in the press. "'Now,' said the farmer's wife, "'since you have worked so well, "'I shall give you a dish of curds and whey for your supper, "'and you may go out into the little orchard "'and eat it under the shade of the trees.' 
Little Miss Muffet had never eaten curds and whey before and did not know how they tasted, but she was very hungry, so she took the dish and went out into the orchard. She first looked around for a place to sit down, and finally discovered a little grass mound, which is called a tuffet in the country, and seated herself upon it. Then she tasted the curds and whey and found them very good. But while she was eating, she chanced to look down at her feet, and there was a great black spider coming straight towards her. The girl had never seen such an enormous and hideous-looking spider before, and she was so frightened that she gave a scream and tipped backward off the tuffet, spilling the curds and whey all over her dress as she did so. This frightened her more than ever, and as soon as she could get upon her feet, she scampered away to the farmhouse as fast as she could go, crying bitterly as she ran. The farmer's wife tried to comfort her, and Miss Muffet, between her sobs, said she had seen the awfulest, biggest, blackest spider in all the world. This made the woman laugh, for she was not afraid of spiders. Soon after, they heard the sound of wheels upon the road, and a handsome carriage came dashing up to the gate. "'Has anyone seen a little girl who has run away?' asked Nurse Tallowegg, leaning out of the carriage. "'Oh, yes,' answered little Miss Muffet. "'Here I am, nurse,' and she ran out and jumped into the carriage, for she was very glad to get back again to those who had care for her and not ask her to work making cheese. When they were driving back to the town, the nurse said, "'You must promise me, Miss Muffet, never to run away again. "'You have frightened me nearly into hysterics, "'and had you been lost, your mother would have been quite disappointed.' The little girl was silent for a time, and then she answered, I will promise not to run away if you will let me play as other children do. But if you do not allow me to run and romp and dig in the ground, I shall keep running away, no matter how many horrid spiders come to frighten me. And Nurse Halloweg, who had really been much alarmed at so nearly losing her precious charge, thought it was wise to agree to Miss Muffet's terms. She kept her word, too. And when little Miss Muffet went back to her home in the city, her cheeks were as red as roses and her eyes sparkled with health. And she grew, in time, to be a beautiful young lady, and as healthy and robust as she was beautiful. Seeing which, the doctor put an extra large fee in his bill for advising that the little girl be taken to the country, and Mr. Muffet paid it without a word of protest. Even when Miss Muffet grew up and was married, she never forgot the day she ran away, nor the curds and whey she ate for her supper, nor the great spider that frightened her away from the tuffet. End of Little Miss Muffet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Wise Men of Gotham From Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum Three wise men of Gotham went to sea in a bowl. If the bowl had been stronger, my tale had been longer. There lived in the great city of Gotham, over against the north gate, a man who possessed a very wise aspect, but very little else. He was tall and lean, and had a fine large head, bald and smooth upon the top, with a circle of white hair behind the ears. His beard was pure white, and reached to his waist. His eyes were small, dark, and so piercing that they seemed to read your every thought. His eyebrows were very heavy, and as white as his beard. He dressed in a long black mantle, with a girdle corded about the middle, and he walked slowly and majestically, and talked no more than he was obliged to. When this man passed down the street with his stately tread, the people all removed their hats and bowed to him with great reverence, saying within themselves, He is very wise, this great man. He is a second Socrates. And soon this was the only name he was called by, and everyone in Gotham knew him as Socrates. To be sure, this man was not really wise. 
had they realized the truth, not one he met but knew more than Socrates. But his venerable appearance certainly betokened great wisdom, and no one appeared to remember that things are seldom what they seem. Socrates would strut about with bowed head and arms clasped behind him, and think, My, how wise these people think me to be! Everyone admires my beautiful beard. When I look into their faces they drop their eyes. I am, in truth, a wonderful man, and if I say nothing they will believe I am full of wisdom. Ah, here comes the schoolmaster. I shall frown heavily and refuse to notice him, for then he also will be deceived and think I am pondering upon matters of great import. Really, the one wise thing about Socrates was his ability to keep quiet, for saying no word it was impossible he should betray his ignorance. Singularly enough, over by the south gate of Gotham, there dwelt another wise man, of much the same appearance as Socrates. His white beard was a trifle longer, and he had lost his left eye, which was covered by a black patch, but in all other ways his person betokened as much wisdom as that of the other. He did not walk about, being lazy and preferring his ease, but he lived in a little cottage with one room, where the people came to consult him in regard to all their troubles. They had named him Sophocles, and when anything went wrong they would say, Let us go and consult Sophocles, for he is very wise and will tell us what to do. Thus one man who had sued his neighbour in the courts became worried over the outcome of the matter and came to consult the wise man. Tell me, O Sophocles, he said, as he dropped a piece of money upon a plate, shall I win my lawsuit or not? Sophocles appeared to ponder for a moment, and then he looked at his questioner with his one eye and replied, If it is not decided against you, you will certainly win your suit. And the man was content, and went away feeling that his money had been well invested. At another time the mother of a pair of baby twins came to him in great trouble. "'Oh, most wise Sophocles,' she said, "'I am in despair, for my little twin girls are just alike, and I have lost the ribbon that I placed on one that I might be able to tell them apart. Therefore I cannot determine which is Amelia and which is Ophelia.' and as the priest has christened them by their proper names, it would be a sin to call them wrongly. "'Cannot the priest tell?' asked the wise man. "'No one can tell,' answered the woman, "'neither the priest nor their father nor myself, for they are just alike, and they are yet too young to remember their own names. Therefore your great wisdom is our only resource.' "'Bring them to me,' commanded Sophocles. And when they were brought, he looked at them attentively and said, "'This is Ophelia, and this Amelia. Now tie a red ribbon around Ophelia's wrist and put a blue ribbon on Amelia, and so long as they wear them you will not be troubled to tell them apart.' Everyone marvelled greatly that Sophocles should know the children better than their own mother, but he said to himself, Since no one can prove that I am wrong, I am sure to be right. And thus he maintained his reputation for wisdom. In a little side street near the centre of Gotham lived an old woman named Deborah Smith. Her home was a wretched little hut, for she was poor, and supported herself and her husband by begging in the streets. Her husband was a lazy, short, fat old man who lay upon a ragged blanket in the hut all day and refused to work. "'One beggar in the family is enough,' he used to grumble when his wife upbraided him. "'And I am really too tired to work. So let me alone, my Deborah, as I am about to take 
another nap. Nothing she could say would arouse him to action, and she finally allowed him to do as he pleased. But one day she met Socrates walking in the street, and after watching him for a time made up her mind he was nothing more than a fool. Other people certainly thought him wise, but she was a shrewd old woman, and could see well enough that he merely looked wise. The next day she went to the south of the city to beg, and there she heard of Sophocles. When the people repeated his wise sayings, she thought, Here is another fool, for anyone could tell as much as this man does. Still, she went to see Sophocles, and, dropping a penny upon his plate, she asked, Tell me, O wise man, how shall I drive my husband to work? By starving him answered Sophocles. If you refuse to feed him, he must find a way to feed himself. That is true, she thought, as she went away. But any fool could have told me that. This wise man is a fraud. Even my husband is as wise as he. Then she stopped short, and slapped her hand against her forehead. Why, she cried, I will make a wise man of Perry, my husband, and then he can earn money without working. So she went to her husband and said, Get up, Perry Smith, and wash yourself, for I am going to make a wise man of you. I won't, he replied. You will, she declared, for it is the easiest way to earn money I have ever discovered. Then she took a stick and beat him so fiercely that at last he got up, and agreed to do as she said. She washed his long beard until it was as white as snow and she shaved his head to make him look bald and venerable. Then she brought him a flowing black robe with a girdle at the middle, and when he was dressed he looked fully as wise as either Socrates or Sophocles. "'You must have a new name,' she said, "'for no one will ever believe that Perry Smith is a wise man. So I shall hereafter call you Pericles, the wisest man of Gotham.' She then led him into the streets, and to all they met she declared, This is Pericles, the wisest man in the world. What does he know? they asked. Everything, and much else, she replied. Then came a carter, and putting a piece of money in the hand of Pericles, he inquired, Pray tell me of your wisdom, what is wrong with my mare? How should I know? said Pericles. I thought you knew everything, returned the carter, in surprise. I do, declared Pericles, but you have not told me what her symptoms are. She refuses to eat anything, said the carter. Then she is not hungry, returned Pericles, for neither man nor beast will refuse to eat when hungry. And the people who heard him whispered together and said, Surely this is a wise man, for he has told the carter what is wrong with his mare. After a few days the fame of Pericles's sayings came to the ears of both Socrates and Sophocles, and they resolved to see him, for each feared he would prove more wise than they were, knowing themselves to be arrant humbugs. So one morning the three wise men met together outside the hut of Pericles, and they sat themselves down upon stools facing each other, while a great crowd of people gathered around to hear the words of wisdom that dropped from their lips. But for a time all three were silent, and regarded one another anxiously, for each feared he might betray himself. Finally Sophocles winked his one eye at the others and said, in a grave voice, The earth is flat. For, were it round, as some fools say, all the people would slide off the surface. Then the people, who had listened eagerly, clapped their hands together and murmured, Sophocles is wisest of all, what he says is truth. This provoked Socrates greatly, for he felt his reputation was in danger. So he said with a frown, The world is shallow, like a dish. Were it flat, 
the water would all run over the edges, and we should have no oceans. Then the people applauded more loudly than before, and cried, Socrates is the wisest of all. Pericles, at this, shifted uneasily upon his stool, for he knew he must dispute the matter boldly, or his fame would depart from him. Therefore he said with grave deliberation, Hmm, you are wrong, my friends. The world is hollow, and like the shell of a coconut, and we are all inside the shell. The sky above us is the roof, and if you go out upon the ocean you will come to a place, no matter in what direction you go, where the sky and the water meet. I know this is true, for I have been to sea. The people cheered loudly at this and said, Long live Pericles, the wisest of wise men! I shall hold that I am right, protested Sophocles, until Pericles and Socrates prove that I am wrong. That's fair enough, said the people. And I also shall hold myself to be right until they prove me wrong, declared Socrates firmly. I know I am right, said Pericles, for you cannot prove me wrong. We can take a boat and sail over the sea, remarked Socrates, and when we come to the edge we will know the truth. Will you go? Yes, answered Sophocles, and Pericles, because he did not dare refuse, said yes also. Then they went to the shore of the sea, and the people followed them. There was no boat to be found anywhere, for the fishers were all away upon the water but there was a big wooden bowl lying upon the shore, which the fishermen used to carry their fish to market in. This will do, said Pericles, who, because he weighed the most, was the greatest fool of the three. So the wise men all sat within the bowl, with their feet together, and the people pushed them out into the water. The tide caught the bowl and floated it out to sea and before long the wise men were beyond sight of land. They were all greatly frightened, for the bowl was old and cracked, and the water leaked slowly through until their feet were covered. They clung to the edge with their hands and looked at one another with white faces, said Pericles. I was a fool to come to sea in this bowl. Ah, remarked Socrates, if you are a fool, as you confess, then you cannot be a wise man. No, answered Pericles, but I'll soon be a dead man. I also was a fool, said Sophocles, who was weeping from his one eye and trembling all over. For if I had stayed upon land, I would not have been drowned. Since you both acknowledge it, sighed Socrates, I will confess that I also am a fool, and have always been one. But I looked so wise, the people insisted I must know everything. Yes, yes, Sophocles groaned, the people have murdered us. My only regret, said Pericles, is that my wife is not with me. If only she were here. He did not finish what he was saying, for just then the bowl broke in two, and the people are still waiting for the three wise men to come back to them. End of Three Wise Men of Gotham This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Bun Rabbit From Mother Goose in Prose By L. Frank Baum O oh, Little Bun Rabbit, so soft and so shy, Say, what do you see with your big round eye? On Christmas we rabbits, says Bunny so shy, Keep watch to see Santa go galloping by. Little Dorothy had passed all the few years of her life in the country, and being the only child upon the farm, 
she was allowed to roam about the meadows and woods as she pleased. On the bright summer mornings, Dorothy's mother would tie a sunbonnet under the girl's chin, and then she romped away to the fields to amuse herself in her own way. She came to know every flower that grew and to call them by name, and she always stepped very carefully to avoid treading on them, for Dorothy was a kind-hearted child and did not like to crush the pretty flowers that bloomed in her path. And she was also very fond of all the animals and learned to know them well, and even to understand their language, which very few people can do. And the animals loved Dorothy in turn, for the word passed around amongst them that she could be trusted to do them no harm. For the horse, whose soft nose Dorothy often gently stroked, told the cow of her kindness, and the cow told the dog, and the dog told the cat, and the cat told her black kitten, and the black kitten told the rabbit when one day they met in the turnip patch. Therefore, when the rabbit, which is the most timid of all animals and the most difficult to get acquainted with, looked out of a small bush at the edge of the wood one day, and saw Dorothy standing a little way off, he did not scamper away, as is his custom, but sat very still and met the gaze of her sweet eyes boldly, although perhaps his heart beat a little faster than usual. Dorothy herself was afraid she might frighten him away, so she kept very quiet for a time, leaning silently against a tree and smiling encouragement at her timorous companion, until the rabbit became reassured and blinked his big eyes at her thoughtfully for he was as much interested in the little girl as she in him, since it was the first time he had dared to meet a person face to face. Finally Dorothy ventured to speak, so she asked very softly and slowly, "'Oh, little bun rabbit, so soft and so shy, say, what do you see with your big round eye?' "'Many things,' answered the rabbit, who was pleased to hear the girl speak in his own language, in summer time I see the clover leaves that I love to feed upon, and the cabbages at the end of the farmer's garden. I see the cool bushes where I can hide from my enemies, and I see the dogs and the men long before they can see me, or know that I am near, and therefore I am able to keep out of their way. Is that the reason your eyes are so big? asked Dorothy. I suppose so, returned the rabbit. You see, we have only our eyes and our ears and our legs to defend ourselves with. We cannot fight, but we can always run away, and that is a much better way to save our lives than by fighting. Where is your home, Bunny? inquired the girl. I live in the ground, far down in a cool, pleasant hole I have dug in the midst of the forest. At the bottom of the hole is the nicest little room you can imagine, and there I have made a soft bed to rest in at night. When I meet an enemy, I run to my hole and jump in, and there I stay until all danger is over. You have told me what you see in summer, continued Dorothy, who was greatly interested in the rabbit's account of himself. But what do you see in the winter? In winter we rabbits, said Bunny so shy, keep watch to see Santa go galloping by. And do you ever see him? asked the girl eagerly. Oh, yes, every winter. I am not afraid of him, nor of his reindeer, and it is such fun to see him come dashing along, cracking his whip and calling out cheerily to his reindeer, who are able to run even swifter than we rabbits, and Santa Claus, when he sees me, always gives me a nod and a smile, and then I look after him and his big load of toys, which he is carrying to the children, until he has galloped away out of sight. I like to see the toys, for they are so bright and pretty and every year there is something new amongst them. Once I visited Santa and saw him make the toys. Oh, tell me about it, pleaded Dorothy. It was one morning after Christmas, said the rabbit, who seemed to enjoy talking now that he had overcome his fear of Dorothy, and I was sitting by the roadside when Santa Claus came riding back in his empty sleigh. He does not come home quite so fast as he goes, and when he saw me he stopped for a word. "'You look very pretty this morning, Bun Rabbit,' he said in his jolly way. "'I think the babies would love to have you to play with.' "'I don't doubt it, Your Honor,' I answered. "'But they'd soon kill me with handling, even if they did not scare me to death, "'for babies are very rough with their playthings.' "'That is true,' replied Santa Claus. "'And yet you are so soft and pretty. "'It is a pity the babies can't have you. "'Still, as they would abuse a live rabbit,' 
I think I shall make them some toy rabbits, which they cannot hurt. So if you will jump into my sleigh with me and ride home to my castle for a few days, I'll see if I can't make some toy rabbits just like you. Of course I consented, for we all like to please old Santa, and a minute later I had jumped into the sleigh beside him, and we were dashing away at full speed toward his castle. I enjoyed the ride very much, but I enjoyed the castle far more, for it was one of the loveliest places you could imagine. It stood on the top of a high mountain, and is built of gold and silver bricks, and the windows are pure diamond crystals. The rooms are big and high, and there is a soft carpet upon every floor, and many strange things scattered around to amuse one. Santa Claus lives there all alone, except for old Mother Hubbard, who cooks the meals for him, and her cupboard is never bare now, I can promise you. At the top of the castle there is one big room, and that is Santa's workshop, where he makes the toys. On one side is his workbench, with plenty of saws and hammers and jackknives, and on another side is the paint bench, with paints of every color and brushes of every size and shape and in other places are great shelves where the toys are put to dry, and keep new and bright until Christmas comes and it is time to load them all into his sleigh. After Mother Hubbard had given me a good dinner, and I had eaten some of the most delicious clover I have ever tasted, Santa took me up into his workroom and sat me upon the table. If I can only make rabbits half as nice as you are, he said, the little ones will be delighted. Then he lit a big pipe and began to smoke, and soon he took a roll of soft fur from a shelf in a corner and commenced to cut it out in the shape of a rabbit. He smoked and whistled all the time he was working, and he talked to me in such a jolly way that I sat perfectly still and allowed him to measure my ears and my legs so that he could cut the fur into the proper form. "'Why, I've got your nose too long, Bunny,' he said once, and so he snipped a little off the fur he was cutting, so that the toy rabbit's nose should be just like mine. And again he said, Good gracious, the ears are too short entirely. So he had to get a needle and thread and sew on more fur to the ears, so that they might be the right size. But after a time it was all finished, and then he stuffed the fur full of sawdust and sewed it up neatly after which he put in some glass eyes that made the toy rabbit look wonderfully lifelike. When it was all done, he put it on the table beside me, and at first I didn't know whether I was the live rabbit or the toy rabbit. We were so much alike. It's a very good job, said Santa, nodding his head at us pleasantly, and I shall have to make a lot of these rabbits, for the little children are sure to be greatly pleased with them. So he immediately began to make another, and this time he cut the fur just the right size, so that it was even better than the first rabbit. I must put a squeak in it, said Santa. So he took a box of squeaks from a shelf and put one into the rabbit before he sewed it up. When it was all finished, he pressed the toy rabbit with his thumb, and it squeaked so naturally that I jumped off the table, fearing at first the new rabbit was alive. Old Santa laughed merrily at this, and I soon recovered from my fright, and was pleased to think the babies were to have such pretty playthings. After this, said Santa Claus, I can make rabbits without having you for a pattern, but if you like you may stay a few days longer in my castle and amuse yourself. I thanked him and decided to stay, so for several days I watched him making all kinds of toys, and I wondered to see how quickly he made them, and how many new things he invented. I almost wish I was a child, I said to him one day, for then I too could have playthings. Ah, uh, you can run about all day, in summer and in winter, and enjoy yourself in your own way, said Santa, but the poor little children are obliged to stay in the house in the winter, and on rainy days in the summer, and then they must have toys to amuse them and keep them contented. I knew this was true, so I only said admiringly, You must be the quickest and the best workman in all the world, Santa. I suppose I am, he answered, but then, you see, I have been making toys for hundreds of years, and I make so many it is no wonder I am skillful, and now, if you are ready to go home, I'll hitch up the reindeer and take you back again. Oh, no, said I, I prefer to run by myself, for I can easily find the way, and I want to see the country. If that is the case, replied Santa, I must give you a magic collar to wear, so that you will come to no harm. 
So after Mother Hubbard had given me a good meal of turnips and sliced cabbage, Santa Claus put the magic collar around my neck, and I started for home. I took my time on the journey, for I knew nothing could harm me, and I saw a good many strange sights before I got back to this place again. But what became of the magic collar? asked Dorothy, who had listened with breathless interest to the rabbit's story. After I got home, replied the rabbit, the collar disappeared from around my neck, and I knew Santa had called it back to himself again. He did not give it to me, you see, he merely let me take it on my journey to protect me. The next Christmas, when I watched by the roadside to see Santa, I was pleased to notice a great many of the toy rabbits sticking out of the loaded sleigh. The babies must have liked them too, for every year since I have seen them amongst the toys. Santa never forgets me, and every time he passes, he calls out in his jolly voice, A Merry Christmas to you, Bun Rabbit. The babies still love you dearly. The rabbit paused, and Dorothy was just about to ask another question when Bunny raised his head and seemed to hear something coming. What is it? inquired the girl. It's the farmer's big shepherd dog, answered the rabbit, and I must be going before he sees me, or I shall have to run for my life. So good bye, Dorothy. I hope we shall meet again, and then I will gladly tell you more of my adventures. The next instant he had sprung into the wood, and all that Dorothy could see of him was a gray streak darting in and out amongst the trees. End of Little Bun Rabbit End of Mother Goose in Prose